Hi, everybody. I'm Tomer. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, Co-founder. and CEO of uh, Datax. We provide software uh, that automatically tunes a server in order to get better performance and energy efficiency. Uh, and uh, in this talk, I want to present how we can get more out of our existing servers using tuning. So it's going to be somewhat of a technical talk. Uh, it's OK. I assume some of you have experience with uh, tuning. But if not, please feel free to interact with me and ask questions. Uh, so let's begin. So I want to start with a bit of uh, intuition. So server manufacturers today, uh, you know, servers are very complex. Server manufacturers don't know exactly in advance what their servers will be used for, what sorts of applications. So what they do is they have a set of uh, benchmarks that they run on their servers that they estimate are representative of what customers will do with their servers. And they make sure that these servers perform well under a wide variety of applications. But when the customer receives a server, the customer runs only one application. And he couldn't care less about the performance of the server for the other applications. So the intuition that I hope most of you have is that if we focus on this one application and let go of the limitation of having to work well on the other application, then we can get better performance. And this is the reason why tuning works. Uh, and if there is one takeaway from this presentation, I would like that to be uh, this slide. So um, I want to be, let, let's start with some definitions. I want to make sure that we are on the same page. So a knob in this uh, talk is a setting on the server that can be changed in real time, can affect the performance and energy efficiency metrics uh, of the server, and it retains correctness. This means that we can play with the setting as much as we'd like on a production system, and still our workload will be able to finish and run correctly. And let's define tuning. So the process of tuning is actually the process of finding the best setting for a particular knob or a set of knobs. And let's look at an example, an example with one binary knob and one application. So let's perform manual tuning on the board. Let's uh, switch the knob on. Run the application several times, record uh, the run times, then switch the knob off, run the application several times, and now that we have all of the results, we can uh, 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 do some statistics and then tell which setting is better and then set that knob to that particular setting. So this is manual tuning. This is how it works at the very, very uh, basic level. So let's look at an example uh, knob. Uh, as an example, I took here CPU cache prefetching. Uh, now, prefetching is uh, um, uh, basically like the weather reports that you have on your mobile phone. Like I have Google Now, I switch uh, to the side and I see the weather reports. And uh, every time I do that, I get the most accurate weather reports instantly. So uh, how does it happen? My uh, mobile phone just prefetches uh, the data. And if I actually look at it, that's great. But if not, then all of the bandwidth and the CPU cycles and the energy, all of that were to waste. So uh, that's prefetching. So CPUs today make heavy use of prefetching because CPUs work at a very high frequency and they need a lot of memory. And there's not enough space on the CPU die itself for all the memory. So most of the memory is actually kept outside on external chips. So every time the CPU has to, uh, uh, to access external memory, it needs to spend an order of tens of nanoseconds just to get there. Now, this may not sound like a lot, but for the CPU, it's like eternity because the CPU can execute hundreds of instructions during this time. So uh, what do CPUs do? C uh, CPUs just employ cache prefetching. So what does prefetching do in this context? Uh, prefetching predicts uh, which data is currently on the CPU die uh, that will not be needed by the CPU in the near future. It predicts uh, which data the CPU will need in the near future but is not on the CPU die, and then prefetches this data, replaces the uh, memory on the die with the memory it fetched from outside of the die. So notice how many times I said prefetch, right? So if everything works well, we're going to get a very high performance boost for the CPU. But if we re accidentally replaced um, useful data, then we start getting a very high performance degradation. So uh, luckily, CPU prefetchers perform very well today. I mean, this is, uh, uh, they perform really good. But in some cases, they don't prefer that well. They don't perform that well. 
So uh, luckily in recent uh, processor generations, you can actually toggle prefetching on and off. Okay, now we're reading the state of the prefetchers. Uh, we read it at zero, this means that the prefetchers are currently on. So let's try a demo program that we wrote. Okay, this is a demo program that accesses the cache in a sequential manner. What happened? It took six seconds. Let's run the same program, but now with the prefetchers uh, off. Spoiler, it's gonna take more time. More time, eight point something. Let's turn it back on and try a different program. Okay, this program took four seconds with the prefetchers on. Let's turn them off. Three point five seconds, right? Something like that. Let's turn prefetchers on. And I'm preparing something for the next uh, uh, slide. Okay, so what we got here basically, uh, I showed you two applications. Uh, one of them prefers that prefetching is turned on, and one of them prefers that prefetching is turned off. So how do you tune it, right? You need to, it depends on your application. Once you know how your application behaves, you can know how to tune this particular knob. But uh, uh, programs are much more complex than that, right? So today, most realistic programs have many phases uh, of execution. Let's look at this example, very simple example with two phases, right? One phase that prefers prefetching, one phase that prefers that prefetching is turned off. And let's try to tune this example. Still running. 56 seconds. I turned prefetching off and I'm running it again. And the idea here is that, um, as you can imagine, we are now tuning for the average case, right? Because we have no way of seeing uh, the different phases of this application. As you might have guessed, I called it uh, phases. It has the two phases. Which processor are you running on? Uh, currently, it's uh, Skylake. It's Skylake, and I didn't say uh, we are running that on packet uh, servers. Packet is a bare metal uh, cloud provider, and uh, they were generous enough uh, to let us uh, run this demo. They have Skylake servers. Uh, <coughs> yep. We have. Okay, 55 seconds, 55.9, you can see it's more or less it's the same. I'm gonna prepare something for the next slide. Okay, so we try to tune uh, this particular application with two phases, prefetching on, prefetching off, and we reach more or less the same, uh, the same result. And the question is, can we do better? Yes? I'm just curious, um, with respect to prefetching, if you look at how you aggregate these software tunings, so like using cache blocking, um, you know, and then doing prefetching with that, like, you know, software tiling into the, into the, the, the cache hierarchy and then prefetching back into the 
I think. Uh, the, Okay. So, so the question is, uh, can we do better than that, than manual tuning? So uh, while it runs in the background, uh, I want to talk about what kind of knobs we can have in the system. We can have hundreds of knobs. For example, in the hardware, like we've shown now, we have hardware prefetching. Uh, we can control SMT or hyper-threading. I know that a lot of uh, HPC data centers, they get the servers and they immediately uh, turn off hyper-threading hyper in the BIOS. Uh, and that's a mistake uh, because it assumes that uh, no application can benefit from that. Uh, there's novel techniques like cache prefetching and peripheral power states and so on and so on. Many, many things that you can change in the hardware that in order to know about, you really need to be an expert uh, in, in hardware. But you also have a lot in firmware. You have uh, dynamic voltage, voltage uh, frequency scaling. Uh, you have power management. You have the choice of uh, microcode. And in the operating system, you have hundreds of knobs uh, that you can tune. You know, task affinity and uh, uh, software prefetching, uh, like you pointed out, and uh, memory allocation algorithms, and uh, IOS schedule, and the list goes on and on to hundreds of them. And you can also uh, tune things in the application layer. For example, uh, maybe in the framework layer like MPI or in the application itself, if it exposes application-specific knobs, you can also tune that. And there is a lot of potential there. But the idea is that there are hundreds of different knobs to tune, and it's really too much uh, to tune practically. Uh, so here are several of the knobs that are in the Linux uh, model uh, subsystem. And uh, if you're going to tune uh, all of them, it's going to take you a very long time. So uh, we, we all know that tuning has a lot of potential, but there are limitations to uh, manual tuning. First of all, as uh, I pointed out, there are hundreds of knobs that you can tune. It's just, it's just too much to do manually, right? So system engineers, they need to choose their battles. They um, tune only specific knobs that they think or they estimate that they have an impact, but they lose on all the other opportunity that they simply didn't have time for. Uh, and uh, these knobs are actually dependent on each other. For example, if you have 10 binary knobs, that's 1 million states. So it's really impractical to check everything. So again, uh, system engineers need to choose their battles. Now, the knob settings are very dependent on the uh, particular hardware. So uh, imagine a data center with uh, you know, thousands of servers. These weren't purchased all on the same day, right? They were purchased in batches. So each batch has a different optimal knob setting. So if you want to tune, you really need to tune for every uh, kind of hardware class. It's enough that you move one uh, uh, expansion board from a PCI slot to another. That's enough to change the, uh, the settings. There are a lot of performance cliffs uh, in this area. And uh, the knobs, the knob settings are really dependent on the application. So if you change the application, uh, you have to retune again. And uh, um, as we discussed before, there is no practical way to see within program phases. So if you're doing manual tuning, if you have, even if you have all the time and resources in the world, you're still tuning for the average case and not taking advantage of uh, dynamic phases and applications, which we know uh, to exist. So all that comes to the fact that it's a very labor-intensive task, and most organizations don't want to spend all of this uh, time and money uh, just for tuning, and uh, uh, it really requires an expertise. I mean, there are hundreds of knobs, and you have to be an expert uh, in hardware, in software, in all of the application stack that you are running, and it's really impossible. So all that leads, uh, sorry, all that leads to the uh, fact that most organizations are simply uh, they simply don't tune well. So this is why we believe that we are entering an era uh, of uh, self-tuning servers, because it makes much more sense for the server to tune itself, uh, to auto-detect whatever is uh, going on and tune it. And this is the software that we are providing, DataX Optimizer, very easy to use. First step, uh, you install it. It's a one-liner YAM install DataX Optimizer. From then on, it's all automatic. Second phase, uh, our software 
uh, detects the workload that you are running, studies it, detects the hardware configuration, and starts to tune. And within several hours, uh, you, are, you can already see measurable performance and energy efficiency improvements. The idea was to make it simple for everybody to use. So there are four main advantages to this kind of uh, software. First of all, it's all automatic. It doesn't require any user input, and you don't need to be an expert. You install it, and that's it. Second, it's adaptive. The workload you're running now is not the workload that you'll be running next week. And uh, it also adapts to the uh, different phases of uh, the applications. It's flexible in the sense that uh, you might want to uh, optimize for speed, or you might want to optimize for energy or power cap. So you can define whatever target function you'd like. And one important thing is that it's extensible. This means that let's say you have a storage appliance that uh, um, uh, you know, the software, our software doesn't support it out of the box. There is an XML file. You can define your own knobs with set scripts and get scripts. Uh, and you can extend. It can be for new hardware. It can be also for your uh, specific application knobs. It's all extensible. So <clears throat> I want to talk a bit more about the inner workings uh, of the software. How, how does it work exactly? So uh, Optimizer uh, harvests input from uh, hardware performance monitors, uh, from OS uh, um, uh, queues, and also, if available, can get input from application, uh, application queues. All of this is uh, um, fed into um, a workload classifier does machine learning and classifies the workload. Once the workload is classified, it's fed into a dynamic tuning engine, which attempts to find the optimal uh, knob settings for that specific workload. And every time uh, some settings are found, they're fed into the system. They can be the hardware knobs, the firmware, the OS, or even in the application. And all that leads to uh, a software package that uh, can improve automatically the performance and energy efficiency just by tuning all of these uh, dynamic knobs. So uh, we spoke before about uh, uh, the phases application. Uh, we tried to run it, took about 55 seconds when it, we turned prefetching on. And when we turned prefetching off, it took again 55, 56 seconds, about the same. What happened there was uh, that uh, one phase uh, expanded and one phase shrank and they canceled out each other. That's why we got the same results. And we asked whether we can do better. OK, what I did there, what I did here is I started the, um, our daemon in the background. And then I ran the benchmark in a loop. And you can see the results going down from 56. We can see 51. See an error in measurement, 53. I'm just kidding, but it goes down. Uh, uh, our software uh, automatically detected the phases of the application, and it outperformed uh, the manual method. OK, let's look at uh, more realistic uh, applications. Until now, it was uh, kind of synthetic. Uh, uh, applications. So now we are looking at Apache uh, web server running again on a packet type 2 server. Uh, it has uh, two CPUs, E5 2650, uh, 24 core, 48 threads. And we are running the Furonix Apache uh, web server out of the box and trying to optimize it. So here we can see uh, four, uh, four phases of execution. Uh, we are running the workload uh, 200 times. Let's talk about the different phases. So the first phase here is the baseline phase. Basically, we're just running it untouched without our software in the background uh, 20 times. And we normalize all of the results to this outcome. Then we start uh, uh, our service in the background. And we run the application for 140 runs. Now, this is where things get interesting. Uh, because you see in the beginning, in the uh, 20, 20 something runs, you can see the jitter here. It goes down, and then you see the jittery behavior. But after a while, it starts to stabilize at above 20% of improvement. All we had to do is run uh, optimizer in the background, we got 20%. Okay, you can see it going on and on. 
Uh, the third phase, we call it the optimization phase, uh, we turned off several parts of the machine learning algorithms and the exploration in order to squeeze more performance. Uh, this can be done if you know your application will not change. Uh, so here we are already 24.5%. And the fourth uh, stage uh, or phase, it's uh, static phase. Uh, this means that optimizer um, applies whatever optimal settings it found uh, during the learning phase and then exits. So there's no dynamic tuning, it's just static tuning and from that point on, optimizer is not in the memory, not consuming any more CPU cycles, it's like uh, uh, manual tuning. Uh, so here we get 8.8%. Uh, okay, that's uh, uh, the same uh, experiment run on a different server. Uh, this is not Packet, this is uh, another server. And we can see more or less the same results. You can see how uh, gradually the performance is improving during the learning phase and then jumping to around 25%. And in this case, uh, static settings perform well. Okay, now um, I want to talk about uh, um, the next experiment. Uh, which is with uh, Mellanox cards done together with uh, Mellanox and uh, Packet. And in this uh, scenario, we had two servers, again, type two connect, uh, connected with uh, Connectix 3.4 network cards to a router. And uh, we took one knob, which is uh, TX microseconds. It's not really important what it does, uh, but basically it's uh, the number of microseconds between uh, interrupts, uh, transmit interrupts, and uh, we took two micro benchmarks, one that prefers uh, 16 uh, microseconds and one that prefers 256, and we wanted to see uh, whether optimizer detects it. So let's start this experiment. That's tricky, one second. <laughs> I'll get it right. Just what? Mirror the screens. Mirror extending. the screens? Let's try one, one more. Ah, got it. Okay. Okay, so now uh, we're running the first uh, application. It's just sending packets uh, for one server to another. Uh, and we can see that it's performing well. It's uh, around uh, line speed, nine point something uh, gigabit a second. And let's try to play with Okay, we can see that the value is 16. Let's, let's see what happens when we change it to 256.
half. Right? Half the bandwidth. Okay? Went up again. Let's try the second application. Okay, so now we see around uh, one gigabit, something like that. Okay, now we see two, around two gigabits. Okay, turning it back to 16, it goes down again. Now that would be extremely hard as a new application that you are running now in your data centers. You don't know exactly how uh, its uh, network is characterized. You have to test it and you have to see. So it makes things very difficult to tune and you can see here that it has a dramatic effect. You could get 2x uh, performance. So let's see if we can do it automatically. Okay, so uh, I've trained it before. Uh, I spared you the time of uh, uh, training. And we saw that it rises for one gigabit. Here you can see it already too. So it automatically detected that this application needs to have uh, uh, 256 and it changed the setting. Okay, let's try the second demo. Okay, we see four gigabits a second. Okay, 9.2, 9.3. So it's all automatic. So um, the default setting on the server was 16. So if your application behaves like the one on the right, then you'll be losing out, right? You'll be running only at half the capacity. Okay, that's okay, but what if you misconfigured? What if your application behaves like the one on the left, but you misconfigured that to 256 because you played with it or because I don't know what? Then you're still missing, right? You can get 2x performance. Okay, here we see another uh, graph of an example. This time, uh, it's a benchmark from uh, CloudSuit running collaborative filtering, uh, recommendation engine running on Spark. Uh, it has uh, three containers, uh, one worker uh, and uh, two, uh, sorry, two workers and one master. And in this case, we've achieved 50% of performance improvement just by playing with the knobs. Okay, so before we conclude, I want to talk to you about uh, the trends uh, that we see uh, behind dynamic tuning, first of all. Uh, the number of knobs is poised to increase because we see that uh, hardware becomes more complex and config configurable. We also see operating systems with every new release of kernel. We can see more and more knobs that you can uh, tune. And we start to see a lot of heterogeneity uh, in the data center, which uh, uh, brings more and more uh, knobs uh, that we can tune. You know, we have GPUs, accelerators, uh, FPGAs, and uh, the second trend is that we see a shrinking in the number of people that can actually understand all of these systems and perform tuning well. Uh, because there's also, uh, in, the, in the general, not in HPC, but in, in the general uh, computing space, there is some kind of uh, assumption that the cloud takes care of everything and all of the tuning. Of course, this is nonsense, because you have to do, you have to do the tuning by yourself. And we see that hardware uh, really matters because there are more opportunities to tune, and we see the trend of um, uh, we see the trend of containers and bare metal versus uh, virtualization. And not only does bare metal get you more performance than virtualization, now with the bare metal you can actually tune it uh, for your application. Uh, so for all of these reasons, uh, uh, we see the, the importance of dynamic tuning uh, rising. 
And uh, we believe that uh, tuning as we know it uh, today is about to change dramatically because dynamic tuning and automatic uh, tuning makes uh, much more sense. Uh, and uh, our software is uh, poised uh, to play a major part in this trend. We have the first uh, feedback-based uh, dynamic tuning engine for the server market. We've shown already significant results, 50% uh, in Spark benchmarks. I won't stand here and say that this extends to all benchmarks in the world. Obviously, it doesn't, and it's still a work in progress. Uh, this is why we are now uh, in beta uh, with uh, version 0 0.5, uh, already released to several uh, uh, potential customers. Uh, and um, I look forward to inter interesting conversations and uh, questions with you. So thank you.